Welcome to Real Life Fiction Stories, and thank you for joining me. Why don't you come in close? Because tonight I have a real honest-to-goodness true story that you can look up for yourself. A story about a serial killer in the Old West, and a woman who could stand by his side no longer. Fifteen miles is a long way to run away from a murderer on foot, especially across the harsh New Mexico desert. One fall evening in 1870 Elizabethtown, New Mexico, Rosa Kennedy did just that. She could see her breath in the faint light of John Pearson's saloon in the distance as she ran towards it, towards safety. Little did any of Elizabethtown's 7,000 residents know that with her came news that would shake the town to its core. Clay Allison and David Crockett, nephew of the Davy Crockett, had been enjoying their evening libations when a dark-haired woman of who tried to scent burst through the doorway out of breath, ready to collapse her body driven only by fear and despair. The men quickly offered up a chair and a drink of her own, as the crowd gathered around offering up comfort and reeking of curiosity. As Rosa calmed down, she began to regale Clay, Crockett, and the patrons of the saloon that fateful evening with the grisly details of Charles Kennedy's rest stop murders. Elizabethtown was booming by the 1870s, with gold and copper mining drawing in hopeful prospectors and their families. Close to five years prior, around 1865, Charles Kennedy had moved to the Moreno Valley along with his wife Rosa and three-year-old son, settling at the base of Palo Flechado Pass on the road between Elizabethtown and Taos. This would be the perfect spot to set up his rest stop and provide him the opportunity to mine the miners. You see, back then, travel was slow, and people often had great distances to travel from one town to another, lugging their belongings and equipment around. Even with a horse or mule, travelers often found themselves weary and in need of repose. Charles had just the place for them. At Charles Kennedy's family rest stop, you would register at the front, get comfortable, relax and have a meal, maybe a bath and a long soak for your weary bones, then disappear. Foreign travelers, miners without families, the young entrepreneur looking for work, all potential victims. When history would look back, the total victim count would lie somewhere between 50 and 100 individuals. Once Charles killed his victims, he would search their bodies and belongings for money, jewelry, anything of value to be stored away, in a location that to this very day remains unknown. Charles had a knack to be able to pick those with something to lose, but who wouldn't be missed. But he wasn't without a close call or two. One winter, as whispers rippled throughout the area of mysterious disappearances, a prominent resident of Taos was making their way to Elizabethtown and took refuge from the cold and snowy weather at Mr. Kennedy's rest stop. They were never seen again. Their horse, however, was. It, along with the traveler's pack mules and belongings, had been found by authorities on Kennedy's property. Not one to cave under investigation, Kennedy quickly told the investigators that while he was sure he had nothing to do with the disappearance, he was positive that local Apaches had been responsible, out to kill or abduct the traveler. Those in charge of the investigation had their suspicions, mostly on the grounds that while Apache attacks in the area had been common, pack animals and the victim's belongings had never been left behind. Without any evidence, however, the investigation was stuck, and the case dropped, leaving Charles free to return to his macabre business. That same evening that Rosa had found herself in John Pearson's saloon, however, would prove to be the evening of Charles Kennedy's final murder. Rosa had reached out and clutched Clay Allison's shirt, pulling him closer as she wept, unable to contain her grief despite the alcohol that burned in her veins. He killed our children. Before we moved here, our two babies, he murdered them. God, I forgave him. Why did I forgive him? Tonight, he killed my son. She would sob at him. Only hours earlier, Rosa and her son sat inside their business and home, and Charles made small talk with a lone traveler out in the front yard. Charles had promised the famished man a warm home-cooked meal, the likes he hadn't had since sitting down in his saddle, no doubt a spell back, and no doubt once more, a meal long overdue. The traveler obliged and followed Mr. Kennedy into the rest stop, further enticed by the aroma of Rosa's cooking, and lulled into complacency by the sounds of a loving nine-year-old child chatting with his mother. During the meal, as the travelers became full and his mouth relaxed, 
he would ask the question that would be answered by his life. Out of pure curiosity, and having a bit of a way yet to travel before reaching Taos, he would look up from his plate right at Charles and politely inquire if there were many Apache or Ute nearby. Charles' son, young, honest, and wanting to be part of the grown-up's conversation, would be the one to answer. Can't you smell the ones Papa put under the floor? It's reported he had said. Charles' eyes grew as big as the traveler's at the words uttered by his son, and his hands dashed to his gun at his side, the eyes of the traveler following the barrel as it squared level at him, his last sight a bright flash. Rosa stood silent, and had been in shock more at the suddenness of the murder rather than the carnage, as she had seen her husband kill before. But when Charles had grabbed their son by the head and slammed it repeatedly into the fireplace until he was dead, she had begun to scream, and collapsed on the floor. Charles dragged the bodies to the cellar before locking up the house, making sure his wife couldn't leave. Patiently, Rosa waited while Charles drank and slowly succumbed to the alcohol, eventually passing out. With the fire cold, the sun gone, and her husband unconscious, Rosa crawled over to the fireplace, scurrying up the chimney and out onto the roof to begin her 15-mile run to Elizabethtown. Clay Allison a man whom by all accounts of those who knew him possessed a hair-triggered temper and a thirst for the hard stuff. This combination made him the definition of volatile, and his reputation as a gunfighter had been known by more than just a few. By the time Rosa had finished her story, still clinging and weeping to the gunslinger's arm, a rage had begun to burn within him. Whether it was a rage over the murder of innocent people, over the murder of a child, or just another excuse for him to kill a man history does not know for sure. Regardless, he broke free from Rosa, reassuring her that justice would be done, and with a voice of command no one in the room questioned, split the group into two parties. Clay and his posse would search out Kennedy. The rest would search his home for evidence. And evidence they did find. Charred bones in the fireplace, skeletons under the floorboards, a skull outside near the home and the body of his son and the traveler in the cellar. Clay had no trouble arresting the still very inebriated Mr. Kennedy, and was able to hold back his urge to end the man's life there and then, at least for the time being. Once in custody, Kennedy was given a pretrial hearing on October 3, 1870, and despite the corpses found on Kennedy's premises, an eyewitness testimony from Rosa as well as another who had come forward, stating he too had seen Kennedy shoot and kill another traveler, the court refused to make determination on the case. Instead, they held Kennedy be tried by grand jury. And this sparked the notion among the townspeople that maybe, just maybe, the Kennedy's lawyer was planning on buying Kennedy's freedom. Kennedy would presumably have access to all the stolen goods he had collected over the years, and could potentially provide a rather comfortable payment for his lawyer's services, as well as afford to disappear and start anew somewhere else. Clay was having none of this, and convinced a group of men to help him finish what they had started the night they caught Charles. The men were able to kidnap Kennedy from his jail cell and remove his head from his body. Depending on which of the two versions you prefer, this was done either by knife while being held down by the men, or by a man on horseback dragging him by a rope around his neck up and down Main Street until the inevitable. The head put on display. Kennedy's body was not granted burial inside the town's Catholic cemetery, and was instead interred in an area outside cemetery grounds. His head's fate is unknown though a popular legend has it placed on a stake outside of Henry Lambert's saloon in the town of Cimarron, until the mummified remains mysteriously disappeared a year after the incident. Not much of Elizabeth Town remains today, the town having emptied out as fast as the mines dried up. Still, the memory of Charles Kennedy holds fast to the valley, as so many questions remain. What of the victims not discovered by authorities? Their families surely never received any closure. What about the money supposedly stolen from the victims? Is there a cache of loot buried somewhere in the Sangre de Cristo Mountains? And for those inclined to a more morbidly curious disposition, how did the mob really kill Charles? And whatever happened to his head? Perhaps time and truth are not done giving up their secrets, and one day we will know. But for now, we're left without answers.